So you might have noticed that he read all the way to verse 23 this morning. We're not going to go all the way to verse 23. Um, we're going to just read the parts of uh, the cleansing part of the temple, driving out the money changers. Uh, next week, we're going to look at the religious leaders who came to him questioning him about what he did. So it's going to be a two-part sermon. And I have to do a lot of the theological heavy lifting up front. Uh, and the reason for that is there are bridges to cross. They say that if you're going to have application, that you need to cross the bridge from uh, the biblical world into uh, our world. And you've got to do that by deducing the theological principle. Well, uh, I need to cross, uh, create a bridge this morning. I have to create a bridge this morning if you're going to understand this text and how it applies to you. So if I must build bridges this morning, there's going to be two. There's going to be a vertical bridge. We're going to talk about that first, from heaven to earth. And there's a horizontal bridge from Herod's temple to today. So the first bridge I want to talk about is the vertical bridge, the one from heaven to earth. Um, I know this is a temple scene that I'm about to give you, but it's still a picture of what's going on in heaven. Uh, Isaiah 6. Is everybody familiar with Isaiah 6? You don't have to go there. Just, uh, it's a very uh, popular Old Testament passage. And in Isaiah 6, it's just this picture uh, of God. Isaiah gets this, this picture of God, and God is in inside the temple. He's inside the Holy of Holies, and surrounding God, uh, as he is sitting on the throne, it says he's high and lifted up, there are these seraphim, and they are just covering their face, and they just say, holy, 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 and they're just repeating this over and over and over again. Everybody familiar with that? Everybody's read that? There's different reactions I think we have when we read that. Some of us are like, well, that's, yeah, that is really just a holy picture. Um, and it's a scary picture. People die in the Holy of Holies. And uh, I'm just seeing something maybe uh, I shouldn't be looking upon. This is something that's way too holy for me. Uh, seraphim, they're created to do that, not me. And. I know in eternity that there's going to be new music and things like that, but I just I don't think that you're just going to sit at home and rock out to third day albums all the time. It's probably going to look something more like what you're seeing in Isaiah 6. Others, maybe you think it's boring. Maybe it's boring. Um, for me, I used to be um, actually kind of frightened too about the concept of eternity, just the very idea of eternity, just thinking that this never ends. And it's going to be me just on my face worshiping. Is that really what's going on? Is that really what we're going to do forever? And just thinking, I don't know if I really want to go there. I want to say... I want, to make, I want us to make no mistake. The seraphim in this text in Isaiah 6, when they are looking at God, they are experiencing the pinnacle of joy. They are experiencing the heights of joy that you can have. They are, we are all created to worship God they are created to worship God. And uh, since they are doing what they are created for, they're experiencing joy. Great joy. They're not doing this out of duty. There's no place in, in the world, in existence, that they would rather be than right there before that throne. Fullness of joy. If you were to take, as believers, we all have this, uh, God gives, you know, just a taste of eternity, uh, the taste of this eternal 
joy. And Jesus is going to say uh, later on in John, uh, my joy I will give to you, right? So if you're a believer, you, you have that joy. Well, take that joy that you've experienced as a believer, and, and I don't think this is an exaggeration, like multiply that um, by some almost infinite number, and you might get an idea of what's going on inside the seraphim as they're praising God in the Holy of Holies. Undistracted minds, undistracted hearts, they are just fully focusing on God as pure worship. Is that what worship looks like at your home? I doubt many of us are like just in a room somewhere just screaming holy, 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 covering our faces. But there is the theological principle of pure worship, of giving God our whole hearts and our whole mind. So that's the first bridge. There's that worship, eternal worship in heaven. It's pure worship. And we're not really measuring up. We can't worship in that way. But here's the second bridge. Since we can't worship that way, I need to talk about the problem. Why cannot we worship? Why can't we worship God the way that the seraphim are? Why can't we give God our whole hearts and our whole minds? And why is there an issue? Uh, there's a, a physical location sort of issue going on with the reason we can't be so near to God in terms of worshiping Him like the seraphim are. And so there's two problems. I'm going to talk about the first. Now, the first is going to sound a little maybe strange, but uh, it's, it's about defiled space. Defiled space. We don't have really hardly any understanding that a space could be pure or holy. But uh, there's a space that can be undefiled and free from sin. Um, take off your sandals, Moses. The place you're standing is holy ground. That's pure space, right? It's a location on the earth. You can stand on it. That's holy. Heaven, sacred space. The earth, when God created it, was sacred space. The garden was sacred space. What did the fall do? The fall made everything on the earth defiled space like a marketplace in the temple. So imagine a house that you love. There's a house you really love, you really like, and, and I've used this before, but you find out someone was murdered within the house. That just sort of ruins that house for you, right? You don't want to be there anymore. It's a defiled house, a defiled space for you. Now, we all emit pollutants in the sense of sin pollutants. We all lie. We all, uh, people all over the earth steal. We murder. Uh, we have hate. We have anger, unrighteous anger. And God sees all of that, and it defiles the earth. Just as a murder would defile some house you like, all of our sin defiles the earth. Now, we can thrive in that, right? Like a cancer that can thrive in a toxic body. We can all thrive uh, inside of a sinful world. We just breathe it in, whatever, but God won't. So how? Do you guys see the problem? So we want to be near God. We want to worship God. But the space that we have to be with God is defiled. So how does God dwell with humans? How does he purify a space? Sacrifice. Sacrifice. So blood, it covers our sin, right? It covers 
Uh, it also sanctifies the space. After the fall, what you're going to see with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all the way until the tabernacle is created, what you're going to see is whenever they go and meet God, in the garden they didn't need this, but whenever they go and meet God, what they're going to do is they're going to take a sacrifice, they're going to climb a mountain and bring an altar. And then after the sacrifice, after uh, their sins are forgiven, the space is clean, then God will show up. The tabernacle. Same thing. Priests used to what they do. They take the blood of the sacrifice and they would just go and sprinkle all parts of the temple and tabernacle so that it would be clean, so that it would be pure, so that he can dwell there. So let's, let's imagine another house that you like. Just a beautiful house. It's got 20 rooms inside of it. And for some reason, you have a loved one who is just a slob, right? He's just a slob. Um, who's that character on Charlie Brown who he just walks around and there's like a dirt trail with him? Pigpen, yeah. So you got Pigpen that lives with you. I do. Her name is Sela. <laughs> I am so serious. She is... She's a filthy girl. So uh, yeah, we, uh, I made mac and cheese for them like two nights ago. Genesis, she gets a little mac and cheese on her finger. Daddy, wipe it. You know, she doesn't want it on. Sela, I look over. I'm not, not even kidding. I watched her for two minutes do this, just massaging her face with the, with the cheese sauce, because that was all that was left. Like, you are just a naturally dirty person. So I got pig pen that lives with me. So you got a beautiful house, 20 rooms, pig pen lives with you. You don't want to kick him out, you love him, but you also don't want to live in his filth. So what do you do? Out of these 20 rooms, I'm going to take one room, and it's going to be a room that is cleaned constantly day and night. I love this guy, I'm going to let him come in and, and speak with me, but after he leaves, oh man, we're going to clean this place up. Well, God out of all the earth, it's all dirty. Out of all the rooms of the house, whatever, so to speak, it is dirty. We're all pig pens. And God, in his tabernacle, in his temple, has a clean space, a clean room where he dwells, and he has priests who cleanse it with blood and sacrifices day and night. He allows us to come in, we pollute it, and they clean it every day. And that's where we're at in our text right now. Herod's temple. Inside, well, I'll actually, we're going to see this next week, but God isn't actually there. Um, I'll talk about why next week. But in Herod's temple, it is meant to be sacred space. This is where God dwells. This is where he's at. And this is why Jesus is so upset. Where do you meet God now? Really, where do you meet God now? Where is the temple? Is there a temple you can go to, to the house of God, and, and praise Him, and be with Him? Yes. <laughs> I didn't know who said that at first, but uh, thank you. Yeah, you, 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 you answered my question, so... But I'm going to get to that in a second. The, the, the Herod's temple, that was destroyed in 70 AD. And there's a reason, uh, and we'll see next week, Jesus is actually the true temple. And when he comes, um, there's going to be this tension between the temple building and Jesus. And the reason for that is because uh, you go to the temple to be with God, but if Jesus is here and he is God, and yet people are still looking at the temple building and not at Jesus, they're looking at shadows instead of the substance. And if they're looking at shadows, the shadow has to go. And that's why the temple needs to be destroyed. But when Jesus leaves, you can't go be with Jesus in person anymore. What's he do? I'm not going to leave you guys as orphans. The temple has transitioned from a building to you. 
These aren't just words. You are the temple of God. Paul says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? There's coming a day, Samaritan woman, when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem will you worship. There's no location on the earth that you'll have to go to. You're going to worship God in spirit and truth right where you're at, wherever you are. Look at verse 16. What does Jesus call the temple? My Father's house. You guys see that? He calls the temple, my father's house. John, throughout his gospel, he's going to make it clear that Christians are going to be kicked out of uh, the meeting place of God. They're not going to be able to go there anymore. So uh, that's one reason people didn't believe. They didn't want to be kicked out of the synagogues, even even though they knew Jesus was the Messiah. Put that together. Um, So what do they do? The disciples ask, you know, they know we can't go to the meeting place with with God anymore, how are you going to make yourself manifest to us? How are you going to do that, Jesus? How are we going to come meet with you? You're leaving. He says this, the Father and I will come to him, the believer, and we will make our home with him. So Jesus calls this temple his Father's house, and he is saying, the Father, that you will be the home of the Father. You are the Father's house. Jesus and the Father dwell in you through His Spirit. Acts 2 is actually just the Spirit coming, just a creation of a bunch of temples. Just a creation of the new temple of God, the church. Jesus talks about, he says, I'll be in you, the Spirit will be in you. Listen to this, this is a a strange one. It says, the person who believes in me, he says, from his innermost being, this is from John, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. What, what are you talking about? I've had a, a, a CT scan. They didn't see any rivers of water coming out of my heart. It's like, what, what are you talking about? Well, you go back to the original temple, the garden. What's flowing out of the garden? Four rivers, right? They're flowing out and they're giving nourishment to all the nations. Why are they doing that? Because in the garden is God and he is the source of life. And Jesus goes on to say, uh, well, John goes on to comment that Jesus said that we'll have rivers of living water flowing out of our heart. He said that because of the spirit that the believers would receive. Meaning, in your heart there is life, and out of you is going to flow, uh, flow nourishment to others. God is the source of life. Garden's the original temple, you're the new temple. Now, what did I say purifies the temple earlier? Sacrifice. Last week, what did we see? That Jesus purifies his bride. Jesus purifies his people. Now that you are actually purified, now he is going to dwell in you. You're purified not just forensically from your sin, but also ontologically. And he can dwell within you. You are the temple of God. You are sacred space. That is this unfathomable, like incomprehensible reality. That this God who dwells in temples, he's in this holy of holies, this inapproachable temple. The Gentiles couldn't even go uh, past the outer courts. That God lives 
in you. Now, when you hear that, you may think, can't live in me, I'm too sinful. But none of that actually just testifies the fact that you're being too simple, uh, sinful and me being too sinful, it doesn't matter. The only thing that, uh, that shows is that even though we are so sinful and he still dwells in us, all that means is that the blood of Jesus must be incredibly powerful and incredibly cleansing. He doesn't have to do it daily. He made one sacrifice and he sat down. Priests cleanse the temple every day. And so, when we are here, when we're all gathering here as a church, I want to be very clear. This church building, this is not the temple. This is not the temple. If you ever hear me say, the church is the temple, I am talking about spirit-filled believers. And so when we come together and we worship God and we have all these spirit-filled believers here, this is just a powerful time of worship together as we are coming together in the Spirit, worshiping God. And that's why online worship will never be the same. And then there are some people that will say things like, oh, don't do that in God's house. I'm not going to church. Don't do that in God's house. Oh, I don't curse in God's house. As if the church is some sacred building. You're the sacred building. You're God's house. You shouldn't be cursing anywhere. You shouldn't be doing that anywhere. As Paul says, you're the temple of God. Honor God with your body. Let's go to the second question. That's the, that's the background I have to give. I had to cross that bridge to show what Herod's temple was and where we're at today or um, the text. It's going to be hard to sort of make sense of. So how do we defile the temple? How do we defile sacred space? John 2, 14. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. So here we see oxen, sheep, pigeons. These are in the temple. These are defiling the sacred space. Now, why are animals in the temple, why, what's the problem with them being in the temple? Well, next week we're going to look at the corruption of the religious leaders. And one thing that they are called is lovers of money. Now, there is nothing wrong. Uh, this, this thing of uh, the sacrifice, sacrifices they're selling to people is actually a very helpful service because not everybody wants to go chase down their own sacrifice. So you go, you buy a sacrifice, you give it to the priest, he'll sacrifice it for you. That was fine. That was good. The problem wasn't um, the actual business practice of that. The problem was the location of the business practice. Is that it's inside of sacred space. The temple is a place where you come and you worship and you be with God and you have a reverence. It's not a place for distractions which is what that would have done. It would have been a huge distraction. And what this is, it's the fruit of the religious leader's sin, right? They, they loved money. Okay, well, let's set up this business within the temple, right? You start seeing um, their sin, it starts having the fruit of, uh, even more fruit of now it's taking place in sacred space. Now, imagine within your room, or in your house, you have a room that's just dedicated to the most awesome stuff in all the world. Like, you just sit in there and you do the most amazing, awesome stuff the world's ever imagined. It's just your room, your dedicated room, your sacred space. One day you go to work, and your loving wife, out of your room, you go in to your room and... Uh, you find out that she placed a, a sewing machine in the corner of your room. Now this 
would be a huge distraction to you from all of the, the awesome things you're doing, right? You don't want that sewing machine in your room. It's just a distraction from all the things you're trying to do, right? It's just an illustration of that, and I want it gone this afternoon, Margie. But that's really just a, a silly, true illustration um, about turning a marketplace as a distraction from pure worship, right? There's a sacred space, marketplace being put there, and it's just distracting people from thinking about God. Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, he sensed that he contaminated that sacred space. How? Um, well, first thing he says is, I am lost. Like, I've, I've wandered into sacred space. He's seeing the seraphim worshiping God. He's like, I've, I'm lost. I've just wandered into this sacred space. And he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. He realizes his sinfulness, and he realizes he's in a place that he shouldn't be. And what we're going to see is God wants everything. God wants everything. He wants pure worship. He wants our whole mind and our whole heart. One of the greatest threats to Christianity, to a Christian faith, in the last couple hundred years was an invention, the wristwatch. If you think about the progress of the world and you compare it to like a bike going down the street, just slowly going down the street, when the wristwatch came, everything, that bicycle would have turned into a Ferrari and just flew, right? Just sped off, right? The progress of the world went at a rapid pace because now everybody knows what time it is at all, at all seconds of the day, and everybody just became extremely busy. You combine that with someone like Frederick Taylor and Taylorism, who took the watch to the manufacturing industry uh, and uh, tried to make work as efficient and fast as possible. And life is just sped up. We've all become so busy. There's a huge, uh, a fast pace we all run. There's so many things that all of us try to accomplish in a day. We have doctor's appointments. We go to the gym. We have meetings. Um, we have uh, work. We have school. We have kids to take care of. We've got to get groceries. There's just so many things that all of us try to do every single day. And what you're going to find is those concerns of life, that level of just being constantly busy, those concerns of life are what is going to choke up the faith within you. They're the thorns that choke up the faith within you. There's no time now to, to slow down and really stoke the fires of faith by reading Scripture, praying. And when we do, we know we're so busy. When we worship, we have one eye on Scripture and one eye on the clock. We worship, we come to God with half a mind and half a heart. This is honestly one of the, the big things in the Old Testament is, is people uh, think about Cain and Abel even, all the way back then, just not bringing their best offering, right? They're not giving God the best they have. In the back of our mind, you're reading Scripture, you're like, what do I have to get done today? This is a marketplace in the back of your heart. We do 10 to 20 minutes, often with half a heart, half a mind. And then we go out and face roaring lions and beasts who want to devour us every day. And for many of us, we come here once a week. There's, there's some other things that happen during the week. But we come here once a week, and we strip the power of a service because even while we're here, we're thinking about things like lunch or professional football. Just half 
hearted worship. I'm here, but halfway here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. That's pure worship. A heart that is undistracted, not thinking about anything else except for God. I don't have anywhere else to go right now. I'm just here to worship you, Lord. Distraction. It's the thief of your joy in God, and it's the thief of God's worship. This is actually the point of the Old Testament Sabbath. You go out and you work six days a week. You go out and you do your business, you work six days a week, and what you're going to start doing is you're going to start thinking that you actually run the world. Well, no, you're going to slow down. You're going to do nothing one day a week, and you're going to realize that I, God, I run the world and not you. We worship time. We worship time. Busyness, it's become a status symbol. The more busy you are, the more important that you look. I got all these things going on and going on. Oh yeah, you're just, you're so important, right? You're so, um, you're so special. Money, money's a flashy idol. It, It comes and knocks on the front door. Uh, We know to fight that we're more on alert to money, but busyness, it sneaks in the back door. It's subversive, it's quiet, and it's so subtle that of an idol that we actually proudly hold it up to everybody. (laughs) I got five minutes for you. Look, no different than somebody holding up a, 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 a God made out of wood. On the other end, there's laziness, and that's a whole different problem. Now, how do you move forward, right? You don't want to be lazy. You don't want to be... Let me tell you this. If you're too busy... To give God, to not give God undistracted worship and time every day, you're too busy. If you can't go to the Word and just read and like, I, I've got nothing else going on, I'm not going to think about what I have to do today, I'm just going to be here with you. If you can't do that, you're too busy. And we manage money, right? We manage money, we uh, we know how much is in our budget. We know how much we can spend. We don't want to go into debt. Same with time. There's only so many things you can accomplish, and you're, you're going to accomplish the things that you want to accomplish every day. And if God is a priority, you are going to prioritize that, and you're going to have time of um, quiet, focused fellowship with him. How do we feel when you talk to people or maybe your spouse and they just, they say they're there, but they're like on their phone and they're sort of answering your questions, but they're on their phone. It's just like half a mind, half a heart, half of their attention. And they're sort of answering things in ways it's like, okay, that's not really what I'm talking about. It's not really what I said. We don't like that. Do we think God likes that? Of course not. Of course not. So what does God do when he sees distractions in the temple? What does God do when he sees the idols laid up in our, the corners of our heart? What does he do? I do want to talk first about this uh, Ezekiel 1. And Ezekiel's a pretty amazing book. A lot of people uh, have a hard time understanding Ezekiel. And 
Uh, he is a mad prophet, but uh, he, he's, uh, when you understand it, it's some pretty amazing stuff. In Ezekiel 1, it starts off with this just throne room scene, this throne on this chariot. But the first thing it shows are these faces, right? Um, just these faces, like just weird faces. They start describing these, uh, these different faces. And then all of a sudden, it just, it's, a, it's a vision that just keeps going up. And then it starts describing uh, the wheels will on the chariot. And it'll just take a while to describe the wheels. And then it goes even up and it starts describing the, the throne. But then eventually, it goes to the one uh, that's sitting on the throne. And what he says would have shocked everybody. Because the person sitting on the heavenly throne had the face of a human. This is Old Testament. Blasphemy <laughs> uh, for, for many people reading it. Why would be sitting on the throne of God? Others, um, there's a tradition that rabbis, they wouldn't let young men read it until they at least reached the age of 40 so they didn't get crazy theories and ideas. Human on God's throne? What is that? Who is that? Of course, this is Jesus, right? Of course, this is Jesus. And seeing this in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus sitting on this throne, he's receiving perfect worship from these beings that are surrounded. They're just praising him, worshiping him uh, day and night. And so he's like, I want worship from humans too, but they've got so many idols within them. They've got so much sin. And so he gets up off his throne and he comes down. And that's what we see in the text. He is clearing the idols and temples of our hearts. He cleanses that. If you remember with Isaiah, he realized he's in a sacred space and he's dirty. And what does God do? Puts the coal on his lips. Purifies him. John 2, 15 and 16. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out his coins of the money changers and overturned the tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So he purifies it. Now you see in this text the zeal that Jesus has for space that is sacred, for space that is reserved for God. Does Scripture not teach us that the, he cleanses the temple, he purifies the temple? Does he not teach us that he also cleanses and purifies us as well? Ezekiel, I will cleanse you of all your idols. The things God does to the temple, he does to us. Well, we are the temple. And if Jesus drives out money changers in the temple, will he not drive out all the idols that we've laid out in our heart? If God used to kill sinful high priests who would walk into the Holy of Holies, will he not kill all of our false worship? I will destroy your idols, says the Lord. I will destroy your idols, says the Lord in Malachi. Jesus has a zeal for every inch of our heart and mind. He doesn't want any space in there that is not his. Take every thought captive. Last week, we spoke about how Jesus gives it all for you. Now this week, he's, he wants it all from you. He wants everything from you. Our life is hidden with Christ. You've been bought with a price. Now we all know uh, that old, old passages about the refiner's fire, right? the refiner's fire, be putting in the, the furnace of affliction to burn away the dross and impurities. Scripture often refers to this as discipline, the discipline of the Lord. 
I want to remember that in our text, the anger that Jesus has is towards the distraction and the idolatry within the temple. Uh, His zeal is for the actual temple. And yes, his anger uh, he has about idols in our hearts, it is towards those idols he wants to drive out of our hearts. His zeal is for you. You can never look at somebody that's suffering from something and say, that's God's discipline. Because you don't know that. You don't know what's going on. Many people suffer for, you think of Job, a righteous man on earth, suffered greatly. With that said, God does use suffering to discipline. In Hebrews, there were people uh, getting their stuff plundered. They were going through all kinds of suffering. These were uh, believers. And what does the author of Hebrews say? You have to stand firm. You have to keep believing God is disciplining you. And if he's disciplining you, he's treating you as sons. I know you guys are going through a hard, hard time, but this is the discipline of the Lord to get you to let go of your sin. And Jesus has a whip, and that whip has many different means to drive out the idols of our heart. It can be encouragement. It can be suffering. It can be a rebuke in the Word. You read the Word, your heart is feels like a rebuke. He uses all these different means, but He will make sure that He purifies you. Lastly, the, in Isaiah 6, what we're going to find out in John is that John tells us that the person that was being worshipped and was on the throne by, uh, and being worshipped by the seraphim, that that was actually Jesus. John is going to say that later in the gospel. And that's an amazing thing. And then you go to Revelation and you think that kind of worship is for seraphim and heavenly beings, but not us. Revelation 4, the throne room scene, it's the exact same sort of scenario. God sitting on the throne. These beings are surrounded by the throne saying, holy, holy, holy. And then right after that, it has humans, God's people, and it says they are casting their crowns uh, at the feet uh, of God, and, and they are worshiping God as well, just as these beings are. And that will be the greatest joy you've ever experienced. If you want joy, worship God with your whole heart and your whole mind. That's the worship God desires. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for this message this morning. Father, thank you for uh, working on me this week with it. I pray, Father, that your spirit would um, would produce fruit and righteousness within it. And just ask you for this grace in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and